So you, you, you have a copy of the screen? Yes, that's fine. Go ahead. Okay. Right, so it's coming up for the students. I can't hear you. Yes, Mary, go on. All oh, right, okay. Yeah. So, so I just want to say in the, the learning by design, there are three key elements that really um, define uh, the tools that we use in the preparation of teachers. And the first tool, and this is a t uh, it's an orientation, but it's also a set of tools for thinking about the diversity of your learners and how you uh, harness their identity in order that they're engaged for the purpose of transformation. And I think all of you will understand and clearly when you choose to be a teacher, the job is not really to get through the curriculum or to uh, understand only content area. What you're doing all the time is tracking the transformation of your learners. How are your learners changing? That is the most important thing that you're doing. How are they changing as a consequence of their engagement with the learning experiences that you have designed? So that's the first point I, I want to make and I'll come back to that. This is very important for us. The second point is what we call multiliteracies, um, which is an understanding of meaning making particularly in the modern world, not only as residing in alphabetical literacy, uh, but also in other means of communication. And certainly, since you're dealing with young children, uh, you understand that very well. Very young children, babies even, have a lot of meaning, a lot of understanding. It's not related to alphabetical literacy, it's related to their sensations, to their vision, to their feelings, to a whole range of other modes of meaning making. Even in the womb, there's some evidence now that there's meaning making that occurs as a relationship to the um, darkness, to, to liquid. I mean, uh, meaning making is uh, produced by the senses in multiple ways. And certainly in uh, meaning making in modern communication, we have devised uh, different modes of meaning making and I'll get back to that as well. And the third one of course is pedagogy. Uh, pedagogy is the designs of the learning activities, the knowledge processes uh, that um, you as a teacher and in fact the kinds of processes that a child is immersed to, some of them are informal but in the uh, teaching context they're the formal decisions that you make that create the learning experiences. And these are the three elements of the learning by design. And I have to say to you right up front that every single one of those elements involves choices. Choices that you make as a teacher, choices that the learners make, uh, choices that are in the environment in which the learning happens. So the word differentiation, which is a very popular word nowadays, trying to address the diversity of the, of the classroom, is really about those choices. What do you understand about diversity? How much do you understand about multiliteracies? What do you know about pedagogy? How do you make choices that are appropriate for the children as well as for the uh, target content area? So I want, I want to say that up front. No good teacher, no good educator operates without choices and without differentiation. So the teacher has to be a designer of learning experiences and an educational professional. I want to stress that because I think it's very, very, one of the most important things. A teacher is not somebody who simply takes a set of textbooks and, and helps translate the content of the textbooks to children. It's not about that. It's about creating learning experiences. And if you're not making choices as a professional, uh, then you're not addressing uh, the complexities of the individuals in front of you. The other part of that, of choice and differentiation, is the learner themselves. The learner has a lot of agency. They can participate. They can choose not to participate. That's agency too. They can behave well. They can choose not to behave well. That's an exercise of agency. And the task of the teacher is to engage their agency, their capacity to make choices in a positive way. So the learners need to be co-designers of their learning in uh, an informal and uh, a formal way. So that's by way of uh, introduction to the things that I want to say. My um, 
how do I move this to the next one? Right. Uh, I the next point I want to make, I want to like Kate, just very briefly, I'm sure all of you have been uh, deeply immersed in the theorists of early childhood education. I've just uh, uh, chosen four here um, and very briefly uh, put up some information about them. Uh, Frederick Froebel, who invented the first kindergarten, and I think you know that the word uh, guard, carton, garden of kindergarten is the garden for children. I mean, he always understood uh, that, uh, you know, uh, children were unique like the flowers in the garden and that they needed to be nurtured and tended and not just left there and different flowers grew differently and, and needed different um, light, more sun, less sun. Uh, so he, he, wanted, he wanted educators and he was the first person who invented the idea of bringing little children together but he saw what the teacher gave, that black and white picture there, what the teacher gave the children were gifts, you know, the gifts that would enable them, just like we give flowers water and, and fertilizer, that these gifts would uh, help them uh, uh, engage their uh, uh, imagination, that they would uh, problem solve, that they'd, you know, engage. And from that uh, original idea, we have created kindergarten classrooms which try to stimulate a child and is attentive to their difference. And Maria Montessori, as well as, as you know for her, uh, she created a whole range of, uh, taking the gift ID further, a whole range of contraptions that push the child to understand different things just by engaging with the contraptions, just by playing with very particular kind of contraptions which would help with number or would help with concept development or help with creating patterns. Again, it's stimulating the child's intellect by intervening with some kind of uh, gift or um, learning experience that would take him to another place, right? And uh, Les Vygotsky, of course, was in, in the same way and I think he's been more influential more recently than, than others. Again, believing that uh, children develop in stages and that you can't take them beyond what they understand, but you're always pushing them uh, further and further uh, in their learning experiences or what he called through the zone of proximal development. But you scaffold it. You, you, you build experiences consciously that take them from one kind of uh, learning to another. So the teacher is a guider that is understanding the capacities of the children. And I think Piaget, the, the fourth one that I've chosen for you, is very important because uh, his contribution to uh, the area that we're focusing on is that logic and reasoning is not inborn. In fact, nothing particularly is inborn. Like, you know, if, you, if you're born to a, a Japanese family, for example, you're not going to speak Greek. It's not inborn to be Greek, even, you know, like it depends on your context. Nothing is inborn. And, and you have to create the conditions, and he had a number of conditions, to take children through their different stages of forming ideas, right? So he, you know, he has, uh, you know, experiences that, are, uh, that take them uh, through more and more uh, uh, unfolding of the capacity for logic and reasoning, right? So the only reason I brought this up is to remind you that all of these theorists and, and probably others that you've studied to focus on really three things with little children. And that is creativity. You know, humans are enormously creative, always creative. And we can never assume, even with a silent child, that they're not being creative. Even with an immobile child, that they're not being creative. That's the nature of being human, is to be creative. And secondly, the nature of being human is to solve problems. You know, like, how do I pick up this? Or how do I move that? Or if I shake this, what happens? You know, problem solving from the most element, elementary uh, activity to the most complex one is a part of being human. And that's one of the things that we try to resolve. Not learning as remembering or sequence, but as problem solving and purposeful, right? So this is very, very important and that these habits early on are encouraged. So active participation from a learner rather than passive uh, res uh, um, receiving or obedience. Remember when in the old days it was a child should be seen and not heard. 
you know, the, and that obedience was really important. But in this context, we, you want purposeful problem solving and a flowering of creativity. And the third one, which is really important, is self-discipline. How do we create the conditions for a child to be able to control their own uh, actions and decisions rather than uh, control them out of fear or anxiety? What's the purpose of, you know, um, asking uh, for advice or sitting down or whatever it is? So those three uh, things come out of the early childhood theorists as very important, creativity, problem solving and self-discipline. So just to take me to my first point, remember I said diversity, there's a lot of, um, it's a very, 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 very complex thing. All of us say diversity matters, we're not racist, we're not prejudiced, we're not sexist, we're not homophobic. We all say that good people have, in, you know, inclusive hearts and um, uh, understand uh, how you, the value of all people. However, when in pedagogy, in, in learning, when we categorize people by um, very crude demographic um, uh, ascribers of difference, like the ones uh, that I've put on, on your slide here, gender, age, ethnicity, you know, educational background, ability, sexual orientation, or, or faith, for example, these are very, very narrow, very, very narrow understandings. You could have you know, six children of Greek background, all of whom have had, if you go to the right-hand side, different life experiences. They speak different vernaculars. They have different interpersonal styles. Uh, their value framework from their family is different. You know, uh, the, the, the life world differences of children are much more important than any crude categories, whether they're Christian or not Christian, whether they're Greek or Albanian, whether they're you know, able or disabled. So you really have to, as a teacher, as a professional educator, right, this is the responsibility of a professional, is to know each of your children uh, and their life worlds. What is it about them? And in order to do that, if you go to the seven categories, some of the things that you need to do if you want to address identity, recognize diversity in a classroom and engage uh, young minds uh, and hearts uh, for transformation. You have to uh, know what they know. I remember when I took my, my eldest son, when he was a little boy, he was at a little Montessori school, and the teachers were concerned that he didn't know his colors, because colors was a concept that was important. And so we puzzled about it. How come he didn't know his colors? He was only a little, little fellow. And eventually it clicked to me that his colors were taught to him by his yaya. And his yaya had taught him colors in Greek. The school hadn't checked to know whether he knew his colors in Greek. They, were, they, they just knew that he didn't know them in English. So the puzzle was solved. But the, so the teachers had to find out what is the knowledge that a child has and how do you build on that, right? Because children will come to you with a lot of knowledge that you're not aware of. Secondly, you need a very flexible approach. Uh, there is no curriculum. There is no textbook. There is no single content. There's nothing that you could go step by step that will be appropriate for all your learners. So you really do need to go into a classroom with great flexibility. But you need deep knowledge, deep knowledge about what's possible in knowledge processes. Because otherwise you cannot draw on a repertoire that is appropriate for each particular child. And then you need to be able to know what to emphasize in any knowledge process or any pedagogy. What do you emphasize with one child? What do you emphasize with another? Um, and fifthly, you've got to negotiate learning pathways for different children. Uh, sixthly, the direction flows um, have to change. Sometimes if you're going in one direction and you think it's not working, well, you have to change and try another direction. And most importantly is you've got to have the child engage with you uh, much more in terms of controlling that direction. Where do they want to go? What do they understand? How you build? This doesn't mean anarchy. Sometimes when you describe these seven points, teachers panic. They say, I'm one teacher, 20 children, 30 children. 
How is it possible for me to do all those things? Well, it is very, very hard to do it one teacher and 30 children or 20 children. So you do need to be thinking about, you know, collaborative teaching, shared teaching, other people in the classroom that can help. It is important to expand the kind of network of people who participate, particularly in the early childhood area, um, and as much as possible uh, bring those who can participate, help and assist in applying what you know is the best way to allow uh, the children to grow in a strong and purposeful way. The second point I want to make is the one about multiliteracies. Uh, children come to school, as I said, with a lot of meaning, most in oral communication and in other uh, uh, sensory modes. Uh, so, they, so they come deeply knowledgeable, right? And the, the task of school usually is to try to take them from oracy to literacy, right? The reading and writing. That's, in fact, not a lot of conversation happens in classroom as we try to move children through to, you know, the alphabet and to uh, uh, handwriting. Uh, and that takes up a lot of time, particularly in the uh, kindergarten moving towards uh, preschool. Uh, our understanding, though, is that meaning uh, is uh, people are, are born into the design, and as you engage them in designing, they recreate their worlds. And we need to be able to engage them in multiple modes, not only writing alphabetical literacy, but also visual meaning and audio meanings and gestural meanings and, you know, to understand how space works. And those two things go together, that it's, it's engaging, making meaning produces new meanings, uh, not simply uh, the uh, repetition of particular instructional devices about reading and writing. That's not meaning. Uh, only by itself, uh, and particularly in the, the, the children in, in the uh, the earliest phases of formal schooling um, have uh, uh, understandings about colour and space and touch, which we need to utilise in the way that we prepare them for making meaning in the school context in a broader way. And there are five questions that we ask about multimodality in order to make each mode important. So whether it's visual or audio or, or alphabetic, we ask the question, what does the sign or what you're using, what does it refer to first? Secondly, how is that connected to other signs? So how is, you know, in and, how is A, N and D connected, for example, to make and? But in a drawing, we'd say, well, what, what's the size of, uh, of the drawing of the, of the mother, for example, with the size of the child? Uh, how are they located? How are they connected? Uh, thirdly, how, how, how is the composition created and what does it mean? Whether the composition is a sentence or whether it's a drawing. What's the context of the sentence? What's the context of the sound or the visual? And what's its purpose? Who are you doing this for and why? So you can see these five questions about reference, about interaction and composition and context and purpose are the same kinds of questions you can ask of space, you can ask it of visual, you can ask it of writing, you can ask it of speaking, right? So when we talk about designing meaning, right, we're born into the design, we act with, with media to redesign, what the, the five questions on the right-hand side are the sorts of implicit and explicit questions that you need to be thinking of as you take the children through their learning experience, be it involving uh, drawing and writing, uh, dancing and you know, or performing or um, uh, audio. Uh, how do they understand that as making meaning, in including dance? You know, what, what does the dance refer to? How are we connected in it? How do we organise ourselves in it? For what purpose? Why do we do it? See, every one of these learning experiences is an opportunity for pushing the intellect, uh, growing concepts, uh, moving children to meaning making, which is very powerful. That just doesn't happen only with alphabetical literacy. So that's what we mean by multiple literacies. Uh, 
to expand our understanding of meaning making across the different modes and to, to recognize that in today's world, particularly with new technology, uh, uh, the synesthesia of everyday life is uh, replicated to some degree in the new technology which allows visual and sound and text uh, to be integrated with just the click on the keyboard. Great, let me move to the next one. Uh, the third point that, that I want to make, of course, is pedagogy. And pedagogy is really very important. It's the choices you make as a professional from your repertoire of understanding about pedagogy that shapes the learning experience for each of your learners and your group of learners. Okay. And what this framework here uh, represents is historically uh, the different ways in which theorists have understood um, learning experiences, right? And of course there is one, one group of, of uh, learning experiences which is about I immersion in everyday life, what children know uh, or what they might experience. So we call that situated practice and it's for early uh, childhood education, of course, a lot of what happens happens in that space, right? What is it that they know? If, if we take, um, you know, growing, you know, growing a real garden, what, what what experiences have they had of a garden? Perhaps we'll put them in a garden so they can see what is happening there. Where's the dirt? Where are the flowers? Where are the shrubs? What, you know, so this is experiencing. However, experiencing uh, is a starting point that creates uh, the the language the shared language that allows you to do the, the things that are in the three other uh, um, uh, sectors uh, of this uh, diagram here. And one of them very importantly is how do you move from experience to conceptualizing? And you know, language is entirely conceptualizing. You know, the, the animal dog is very different from de og you know, very different. It's not, nothing about it is the same and there's no way of guessing that the real thing, oops, that the real thing, the actual animal and the word are the same thing. So it's entirely a conceptual, a conceptual understanding and it requires uh, overt instruction, actually intervening to make those links for the child. And, uh, you know, recognizing that the sound and the patterns because that's what language is, it's sound and patterns relates to something in everyday life. And then they have a theory of, uh, you know, a category animals of which dog is one of them. So all of that is actual conceptual work and how far you take a little child depends on uh, their capacity to relate what you're teaching to their understanding and their practices. So that's really important. Uh, if we go to critical framing and analysis, uh, why do we learn the word dog, D-O-G? Why do we learn it? They, you'd have to have a, a child needs to understand a reason for it. Perhaps it's to go home and uh, take something to their parent and explain something that they've learned. But it has to have a purpose. Uh, and, and all that analyzing does is to say, what is the purpose of doing whatever we're doing and what's its use beyond what we're doing in the classroom. So they're the two uh, capacities. And finally, the way you know if, if something has been learned is when a child can apply it, apply that learning to some other kind of practice. So uh, can they do it appropriately and can they do it creatively? So these are a range of learning activities uh, that to go back to that, that early childhood, uh, um, those early childhood theorists, uh, expand creativity, they build on problem solving, they build self-discipline because to move from one to the other means emotional and intellectual self-discipline. How do you move from the reality of touching a dog or playing with a dog to the word dog, D-O-G or skilly, to the idea of animal or zoo, which is theoretical, right? These are quite big leaps for little children and they need to be scaffolded in careful ways and then you need to know whether they're trend, uh, applying them in another setting, right? So 
pedagogical processes and knowing when to use which one, it's not as if you can use all of them in a sequential order with a classroom. It's not how it works if you're seriously addressing diversity, which is what each individual child does. So there might be two or three children who are operating in the same way or another one that's in a, that needs special help or five that are capable of uh, moving into transform practice. So remember, you as the educational professional need to have deep knowledge about the tools that are available to you and how you deploy them uh, in order to allow the child to flower, to feel comfortable, to feel in control, to move through their learning in a way that uh, it makes them both happy and transformed as, uh, and, uh, as they become more capable. And I just want to show you two examples very quickly. Um, uh, Mary, allow me to, to ask you, uh, is Bill around? Yes, yeah. both, okay, both, yes. So, both Bill and Rita are here. Yeah, but Rita is going to be for tomorrow. It doesn't matter, Bill. We want Bill. Okay, then. Oh, so yes. you might be able to uh, conclude and give us two examples, and then uh, uh, we'll give uh, the, the floor to Bill. All right. Thank you. Um, can I just ask you one thing? Am I going too quickly, or do you think people are... Hold on a minute. Oh. I'm going to ask. Uh, now, how are we Θέλετε να κάνουμε μία μικρή περίληψη για το τι υπόθηκε, παρακολουθούμε πώς είσαστε. Υπάρχει και μετάφραση, έτσι, όποιος θέλει μπορεί έξω να πάει να πάρει τα handsets και να γυρίσει μέσα, έτσι. Αλλά είναι καλή ιδέα να εξασκούμαστε και λίγο. Λοιπόν, ε, είμαστε εντάξει, ακολουθούμε μέχρι τώρα. Ναι ή όχι. Ναι. Οκ, okay, Mary, yes, that's fine. You're right. right. I've got five minutes, is that right? Yeah, five minutes right. and, and then right. Bill is going to be a speedy... Right. Okay. It's very hard talking into a into my own powerpoints. <laughs> All right. You look me. You face me. Yes. Great. Okay. All right. I'm just. They're in the room here with me. Okay. So here is my my first example. It's a a piece of a, a page from the work of a, a small child in an early literacy class in Bang Bamaga. That's in northern Australia. It's a, it's an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. Uh, class uh, in the tropics of Australia, where they where coconuts grow, but this is a lesson in multilingualism and multimodality. If you can see, the writing is in to in Torres Strait Creole, okay. And what it says, uh, I'll just um, uh, let me go to it. What it says at the top is today is Thursday, the 10th of October. That's in the first uh, top. And then underneath that it says the root goes down and the root go and the shoot goes up. And then there's a little drawing at the bottom. So what this does in experiencing, if we go just first of all, uh, the teacher has chosen that the children talk about coconut trees, which is in their local environment. They're all very familiar with coconut trees. They eat them. Uh, they're part of their uh, everyday background. So. The lesson has been about the uh, coconut trees and what happens, how they grow, and uh, what their role is in the community. So the first part is discussing uh, how the seeds operate. The second part was actually concept, naming. So they're using SID, right, which is the local word for coconut, and, and, uh, and soot and rub, these are the local words, and they're naming them. You can see in the diagram they're naming the coconut and they're saying it goes, uh, uh, the uh, shoot goes up and the root goes down. So this is scientific labeling uh, that they've begun to do. And they're beginning to theorize in general that all shoots go up and all roots go down into the earth. So they start with the coconut, but they're learning more general things about shoots and roots. They're also looking at uh, why they need to know things about coconuts in their local community. Coconuts fall down and hurt people. Um, so how do you manage them? You need to, uh, to make sure you don't sit under them when the coconuts are growing. Um, uh, and uh, so they understanding uh, uh, about the uh, broader issues that uh, go with coconuts. But the text itself, as you can see, is both a little... Uh, recount of what 
happens when a, a coconut grows, and it's also a little scientific diagram with labels in the way that you would label any piece of science. So as those kids are moving conceptually uh, with their language, and uh, this was done in two languages, uh, in Torres Strait Creole that you can see here, but on the other side, they also wrote it in standard English. So the teacher was giving them uh, the ability to see the relationship between standard English, their own language, uh, Torres Strait Creole, and of course moving them into theorizing and conceptualizing with the diagrams uh, that were below. And then in applying, uh, they were to go back and find out from their parents uh, other information about uh, coconuts that they might bring into the classroom, and they were going off to visit the local council to find out how they manage trees from the falling coconuts, right? So what's, it started off with something they understood, moved into science, and then expanded them into a greater understanding uh, about other aspects of coconuts and their local environment. So this is an example of multiliteracies, plus an example of how the uh, learning processes, the knowledge processes, uh, were applied to ensure that the exercise became as rich as possible and expanded the children beyond their own understanding. My, sec uh, my second example uh, comes from a piece of research by Anne Clunan. Uh, I won't go into this page, I'll just go straight into the research. Uh, but it, 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 her point is that teachers really need to be very knowledgeable and to make appropriate choices for learners. Uh, but it's a book called Rosie's Walk. Uh, this particular teacher was going to present the children with this uh, uh, story, but she was going to do it in a multimodal way. So she presented it to them in uh, uh, w reading. So they read the story alphabetically. Then she presented to them uh, just um, uh, with the sound, because it was a, 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 it had a, a video attached to it, uh, the sound without the pictures, and then she showed them the pictures without the sound. And what she was getting them to try and understand is how alphabetical literacy, how sound and how visuals make different sorts of meanings, and how together in this book uh, they produced uh, the, the story. So, here are the texts. She got them to look at the linguistic text. This is just a page from the book. Uh, and so they're saying, you know, what is, uh, they got, she got the children to recount who were the characters, what are they doing, and then how did it feel, what time was it written in? You know, they say it's about the past, it's not about the present. What kind of nouns, what kind of verbs were there? Um, uh, you know, was it a complex story or a simple story? And what was the purpose of the story? You know, um, the story has a, a hen that's walking very confidently and there's a fox that's uh, uh, hanging around anxious to uh, uh, enjoy the hen as his meal. So anyway, they looked at it first as a piece of writing and they went through the five questions about context and organization and purpose. She then got them to look at the pictures, right? without the language, right? And if you can see, um, the fox, uh, the chicken is walking, you know, with its legs up in the air, very confident, and there's the fox coming from up above with its eyes, greedily looking at the chicken. So what do the pictures tell us, right? No language, uh, no sound, you know, and they can tell that there's meaning in the way that this drawing has been put together and, um, how the creatures have been uh, humanized or be given the, the sensations of, of people. She then, and I don't know if you can hear this. Yeah, a bit. Right. She then gave them the audio. Right, I'll just stop it. But you can tell she got them to listen to the, the music and say, you know, 
what does it what does it tell us about this story? It had an American accent, for example. What about the tapping of the feet when the chicken was walking? Was you know about optimism and what does the repetition mean uh, for the story? Um, uh, what happens when when the when the fox comes? How does the music change? So again, they're looking at they're asking these five questions of the music, and you can see in this way what she's done. Right, and I'll just go to this last part. Yep. Is she planned and analysed her lessons uh, to take on board the multimodality, so she can teach kids about the linguistic, what designs go into making language work. What kind of designs uh, exist when you're using the visual? What kind of uh, signs about the gestural? What kind of signs and designs are in the audio and in the spatial? And then she, she categorized that according to experiential learning, uh, conceptual, moving into conceptual learning, and then analyzing uh, some of the um, uh, uh, reasons why particular choices were made and then asking the children themselves to uh, write something similar, to understand the characters themselves, uh, and to uh, make meaning amongst each other using the devices uh, that they've learned. Whether they're linguistic or visual or gesture or, or audio or spatial, she created other events where those things that she had taught could be demonstrated by the children themselves so that they uh, uh, were genuinely uh, transformed in their knowledge and their meaning-making capacities. So in this example here, she, she's demonstrating how she's bringing together uh, her repertoire, her understanding of pedagogy, her understanding of multimodality, and how she's created a very, very rich environment for those children uh, to understand how meaning is made through those multiple devices. And I just want to finish on this quote uh, that she uh, made for her research. He says, normally teachers don't work in this way. They don't work with these kind of different la layers. But she said you have to train yourself to think in ways that uh, address where, where the children are and where you want to take them and how you can use tools in a clear kind of way and that she, her, her understanding is that the kids were very, very, very quick to understand and move forward when they were challenged and taken right to the point where their uh, understanding was stretched. So I just want to finish on that note then, and uh, I've just said it's, it's not the end. Uh, I hope that was a helpful introduction to the learning by design uh, pedagogy, which I think, Eugenia, you have been uh, working with people uh, in their um, formal lessons. Is that correct? Yes, yes. And then there are students here. I think delightful to, to, to hear all these uh, multimodality sort of uh, lines that uh, you put. And I think hopefully they're going to be able to rework the posters um, based on that multimodality uh, right. matrix. Right. right. Now, I've, I've sent you that PowerPoint. Yep. You can share it Excellent. because I went through it very quickly. Oh. But uh, it's a, a available there to, to learners if they want it. Excellent. So thank yes. you very much. Thank I'll you. ask Bill to come over here All now. Right. Thanks, Mary. And uh, Bill is going to have like 15 minutes or so. Thanks for that. Thank you.